want to speak this morning on the topic of the way of wisdom. Henry Ford one time asked electrical genius Charlie Stainmans to build generators for his factory. And one day the generators stopped working. They've tried everything and they couldn't fix them. So Henry Ford in frustration calls this genius Charlie and says you need to come and fix those generators. We've done everything. So Charlie comes back to Henry's auto making factory and within about 30-40 minutes finds a problem, uh, turns on the generators again and they start working again. And then Charlie sends a bill to Henry Ford for $10,000. Of course Henry Ford was shocked. He says, you spent literally 30 minutes. Why are you charging me $10,000? And Steinmans sent this reply. He said, for tinkering with the generators, $10. For knowing where to tinker, $999. Something happens when you have wisdom and when you have knowledge. It's a secret not only to success, but it's a secret to your destiny. What we must understand, the Bible teaches a lot about wisdom and the Bible talks a lot about knowledge. Someone said that he who knows not and knows not that he knows not is a fool. Stay away from him. He who knows not and knows that he knows not is a child teach him. He who knows and knows not that he knows is asleep, wake him. He who knows and knows that he knows is a wise person, follow him. Wisdom is the human quality which enables the planning and successful achievement of a desired goal. It's an expressed, it's expressed as a technical skill, practical instruction, even in political and life affairs. The Bible tells us the value of wisdom is that wisdom is priceless. Wisdom leads to life. Wisdom brings prosperity. Wisdom gives security. And wisdom touches the whole person. Wisdom results in the right action. And wisdom results in watchfulness. If you're taking your notes, write this down. Is that faith wins battles. Wisdom builds homes. The scripture says in Proverbs that wisdom has built her home. That wisdom has seven pillars. In Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about faith conquering mountains, faith conquering battles. Jesus says faith can move mountains. And and many Christians, they begin to activate and grow in their faith and rightly so because without faith you cannot please God. By faith, through faith we are saved by grace. Faith is very important. It helps you to go through trials. It helps you to go through difficult things. It helps you to trust God when everything is falling apart. And many Christians, I will submit to you, grow in their faith, in their trust in God, but they lack wisdom. That's why they win battles, but they can't build anything. They win battles, but they can't prosper. They win battles, but they can't build a good family. They win battles, but they can't walk in good health. They only know how to get healing. They don't know how to walk in divine health. They know how to get a breakthrough, but they don't know how to walk in the way of blessing. Their marriage, their finances, their business, everything about their life resembles constant need of a miracle. Instead, a sign of God's blessing. Now this message is not a bless me club, health and wealth. What I want to submit to you today is our God is a wise God. He gave four books in the Bible that deal with wisdom. Book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon and Book of Job are all called wisdom literature. God doesn't just want us to live by faith. He wants us to walk in wisdom. He wants us to be as innocent as doves and as wise as serpents. Wisdom is a principal thing. Now, Dr. Henry Cloud said this, there's three kinds of people in this world. There are wise people, there are foolish people, and there are evil people. This will help you to deal and recognize people. Wise people, they're open to feedback, they learn from experience, and they adjust their behavior based on correction. How you relate with the wise person is this, you discuss problems with them, you provide them feedback 
and they will start growing and changing. And wise people are the best people to be married to, work with, work for. Wise people are crucial. They're the secret to success. The second category are fools. Foolish people, they reject correction. They resist change. They blame others and they do not adjust their behavior. What do you do with foolish people? You don't discuss problems with them. You discuss consequences. You discuss consequences and you stop discussing problems because a fool cannot learn. He cannot change until he's facing the pain of his bad decisions and only then he is forced to change because he can no longer live like he's been living. There's a third category of people and these are not foolish people. These are evil people. Evil people intentionally harm others. They seek to destroy and cause damage. With evil people, you don't discuss problems and you don't even discuss consequences. They're way past that. You got to avoid engagement and focus on your protection. Use legal and financial or even law enforcement services to safeguard yourself and your interests. Do not expect them to change. You have to maintain the firmest boundaries possible. These are the people you have to have a gun for. These are the people you have to have a mean German Shepherd for. These are the people that you can't reason. They are bent on evil. Now can God change them? 100%. But until He does, He gives you wisdom to stay away from them. So there are wise people. There are foolish people. And there are people that are so corrupt and evil in their nature. They're not foolish. They're, mal they they're filled with malice. They're there to destroy you. And they do it with an intent. Not unintentionally, out of ignorance, out of this naiveness. They said and done something. A little bit proud and arrogant. These people are evil and bent on evil. I've had few run-ins in my life with evil people. At first, I misunderstood them and I thought to change them. I tried, tried to talk with them and that led nowhere. And you see book of Proverbs explains that to us. God wants you to be a wise person. He wants to take a fool and makes him into a wise person. The gospel of Jesus Christ takes a dead person and makes them alive. But the principles, the teachings, the Bible, the Word of God and the truth takes a fool and turns them into a wise person. God doesn't just want you to be saved. He wants you to be wise. Because there are saved people, but they are fools. They reject advice. They never listen to anybody. They're impatient and impulsive and their life reflects that they are going to heaven while living in hell. God wants you to be wise. Now and when it comes to wisdom, there are three words in the book of Proverbs we have to understand. The first word is the knowledge, the second one is understanding and the third one is wisdom. Knowledge is acquiring facts about things as they are. Understanding is properly interpreting those facts and wisdom is practically applying those facts in real life. I like what Tony Evans said. He said, wisdom requires knowledge and understanding. Just like it takes both a man and a woman to come together to form a new baby. When knowledge gets married to understanding, it has a baby and the baby is called wisdom. Come on somebody. When knowledge, the true nature of a thing meets understanding, which is an enlightened purpose of the thing, the baby is born called wisdom. You can have understanding and lack wisdom. You can have knowledge and lack wisdom. Wisdom is that takes that knowledge and that understanding and puts it into practice. You know, a wise person learns from mistakes of others and God's Word. A foolish person learns from their mistakes. No, no, a smart person learns from their mistakes. A foolish person doesn't learn at all. And that is true. Now, I want to speak to you about the way of this wisdom. Write this down. Number one, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You can read a book and acquire knowledge. You can come to a church and acquire understanding. What really gives wisdom is the fear of God. Now when I say the word fear of God, for some of you maybe you're new to church or you're new to Christianity, that maybe triggers you. When I say the fear of God, I don't mean being scared of God. 
When Adam committed sin, the Bible says Adam was afraid of God and he fled God. The fear of the Lord doesn't cause you to run from God. It causes you to run to Him because it's not being scared of God. It's being reverently in awe of God's goodness and God's greatness. I think it was John Bavir who said, is the fear of God is not being scared of God. It's being scared of being away from God. Come on somebody. The fear of God is not being scared of who God is. It's being scared of not being with Him. The Bible makes it very clear in book of Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 9.10. Proverbs 111 verse 10 it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do His commandments. His praise endures forever. Fear of God is incredible respect and reverence growing out of greatness and the power of God. See the key difference between the wisdom of this world, the wisdom of the Greeks, the wisdom of the ancient people who had certain bits and pieces of wisdom. The key difference is this. Biblical wisdom is grounded, rooted in your view that God is good, holy, powerful and you reverence Him out of this knowledge of who He is. Really relationship with God is God revealing Himself to you and you respond to that revelation by having reverence toward Him. People walk around today and say, I have a relationship with God. It's kind of like, it's a very general term. It's like people who say, I have a relationship with my dad. Well, that doesn't say a lot. Because you're, you, you might not even talk to your dad for 10 years and say you have a relationship. It's dysfunctional, but it's relationship. So when somebody walks around, they say, I have a relationship with God. A lot of times what I want to know is not do you have a relationship with God, is do you have a reverence for God? Do you have reverence for God? Because a relationship could mean a lot of things for different people. And the biblical understanding is not only that we simply call God our daddy. Hashtag homie. God is my friend. We go to Wendy's together. And so many people, they have familiarity with God and they lack the fear of the Lord. Other people, their relationship with God is based on feelings instead of fear of the Lord. Two extremes. There is these crazies who just love, they're hyper super spiritual, super sensitive, see a demon behind every bush or an angel behind every light and everything about God for them is the feeling. They have a feeling of God. The Bible doesn't say the feeling of God is the beginning of wisdom. What you feel about God is not as important as how do you reference Him. Your feelings, they can be misguided. Your feelings cannot be always trusted. But the reverence, this honor that you have toward God is the secret of wisdom. The other alternative is familiarity. Oh, I know everything about God. That's, that's, that's awesome. That's good that you know about God. That's good that you understand Greek. That's good that you maybe even read in Latin. That's good that you have a Bible degree. But my question to you is not how much knowledge you have, but do you have reverence for God? And that will be always evidenced in how much wisdom you walk in. You can claim to have a fear of God. But you, you don't have to tell people you have fear of God. Your life will show the fruit of wisdom. Because people who walk in the fear of the Lord have wisdom. They may not always be the most educated and sometimes they are not the best looking. Like me for example. They might not be the most connected. They might not have been born on the right side of the tracks. They might not have the best family history. They might have so many things stacked up against them. But there's one thing that they have that really attracts wisdom in their life and that is this. They fear God. They walk in the fear of God. What breaks my heart about my generation of Christians is they are over focused on the love of God to the point of almost not focusing and having any reverence for the Lord. I love God. That's awesome. That's the first commandment. My question to you, do you fear Him? Oh no, I'm not scared of God. I'm not talking about being scared. I'm talking about do you reverence Him? Because what will keep you on the track, 
What will keep you grounded isn't the fact that you emotionally love God. It's that you devotionally fear Him. One of great examples is Job. The Bible says this about Job. And Job feared the Lord. And then it says he shunned evil. See, it right away connects. People who fear God, they right away run from evil. And then it says he was so wealthy. He was so blessed. God put a protection around him. And even Satan noticed that Job feared God. And Job loses everything one day. And he strips his garments in grief. And the scripture says, and he worships God. See, that's, that's when you know a person fears God. It's not only when they know how to process blessings. It's when they know how to walk through pain in worship. They don't worship God for the struggle, but they worship God in that struggle. Now look at Job's wife. She doesn't have fear of the Lord. Job's wife says, curse God and die. And Job said this to his wife. He says, you speak like a foolish one. He says, the difference between you and me, honey, is this. God is not a, it's not a vending machine I use to get a blessing. He's not a means to a goal. He is my goal. He's the reason I live and I worship and I honor Him. I have a fear of God and I don't do that only when I am blessed and prosperous, healthy and wealthy. Everything is good. I do that throughout my life and therefore I will trust Him even now. I will honor Him. Why? Because I don't just have riches, I have wisdom. And my wisdom doesn't come because I'm smart. My wisdom comes because there is a God. He is good. I don't understand what I'm going through, but I trust this God. I don't see the full picture, but I know He has the puzzle. Joseph is another example. Even Pharaoh saw that Joseph feared God. See, Joseph had a great gift of God on his life. In prison, he interpreted dreams. But see, Joseph also had wisdom. Because he shows up in the Pharaoh's court, he translates the dream supernaturally, gives the whole blueprint, seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, and nobody asks for his opinion. Then he says, Pharaoh, I'm just gonna kind of go on a limp right now and give you a plan. In the seven years of plenty, all you got to do is take 20% of everything that you guys make, store it aside. And then when the seven years of plenty will end, you will come to a seven years of famine. You can take this, the extra stuff that you had and sell it. You can actually become prosperous even in a famine. And so this is a whole plan. Pharaoh looks at Joseph and he didn't say, oh, look at how anointed Joseph is. He says, look at the wisdom. He wasn't impressed with the gift. He was also impressed with the wisdom and then he hires Joseph. Joseph, see faith can get you out of your prison. Wisdom gives you a key to the palace. Faith can get you out of trouble but when you start having wisdom you can walk into God's blessing. And Joseph didn't just have gifts and, and great faith in God. Joseph also had wisdom and you see what the root of that wisdom is. First, fast forward to the end of Jacob. Jacob dies after the funeral, the brothers of Joseph who betrayed him, sold him, made lies about him, meet with Joseph and they say, we're scared. Would you, could you please forgive us? Our dad is dead. We don't want you to hurt us. Don't retaliate for what we did. And Joseph says, what are you talking about? He said, what you meant for evil, God used for good. And then he, there's this one phrase there says, I fear God. I won't punish you. Not because I can't. Because I fear God. I'm not mad at you. Not because I'm a good human. I fear God. The reason why I live the way I live is because I fear God. See, when you fear God, there's a wisdom that flows into your life. And this is, the, this is part of that wisdom when you fear God. You'll be able to look at the bad things that are happening in your life and not jump to the conclusions. That God left you, forsaken you, you're cursed or something bad is happening to you because of ABCD. A lot of times when you fear God and God gives you this wisdom where you see your bad things from the perspective of heaven. Have you ever made a cake? I haven't. <laughs> My mom has. When I was a kid growing up, I remember when there were different ingredients in different little spots on the table as the cake was being made. And you know, a little kid, I thought because the final product is going to taste good, all the ingredients is broken apart, also taste good. So uh, 
So I put my finger in every single thing. They didn't taste good. Baking soda wasn't sweet. Flour wasn't sweet at all. And what I found out is if you separate ingredients alone, they are not pleasant and sweet. But when you put them together, when a, when a chef, when a cook puts them together, the final product is sweet. It would be foolish for me to come and say, the cake is bitter because bacon, not bacon, because I hope cake didn't have a bacon. I was just seeing if you were paying attention. No, we don't have bacon in our cakes, just FYI. You're like, Russian cakes have bacon? I love me some Russian cake. <laughs> Baking soda. You see how they both sound the same. <laughs> Baking soda doesn't taste good. Therefore, the cake is not going to taste good. You know who, who thinks like that? Somebody who doesn't cook. But when you cook, you put stuff together, it becomes a cake. Did you know in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, We know all things work together for good but when they are separate they're not good Joseph said to his brothers rejection wasn't good but when God put it in the cake in the context of what God was doing it led me to Egypt be being betrayed and being lied against was not good it's like baking soda did not taste good but see the wisdom comes from the fear of God and I take take a step back and I begin to look and I see the bad things that God used to accomplish good things in my life I'm not saying they were good what I'm saying is that God was good and sometimes he was working behind the scenes and I did not even know that the things that I thought will end me was just a stepping stone to what God was planning to do that's why Joseph said I fear God I will not retaliate. I am not going to get depressed and take my life because my life is hard and difficult. Why? I fear God and my God will take the bad things that you meant and He will turn it for my good. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If you get the fear of God, you will begin to have wisdom in how you see the challenges. The devil will whisper to you and say, this thing will end you. But see, the fear of God will tell you, no, 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 nobody can end me. There is a God and I'm submitted to His sovereign will. I trust in God. This sickness doesn't have a final say. This problem doesn't have a final say. My enemies do not have a final say. There is a God and He has a final say. The circumstances will come and put a period. God comes and puts a comma and says, I'm not done with you. I'm not finished with you. Fear God. And you gain wisdom on the hardships of life. I read uh, this in Max, Lucado, uh, Max Lucado's book about a farmer. A poor farmer had an incredible, beautiful horse. Everybody wanted to buy his horse. He was so poor, he didn't have any money, but he had a really beautiful horse. He refused to sell his horse. He says, it's my horse. He treated his horse like a person. He says, would I ever sell a person? He loved his horse. After a while, he woke up one day and his neighbors came to him and said, your horse is gone. See, somebody stole your horse. And they start saying, see, what a fool you are. You should have sold the horse and would have been rich, but now you're poor and you don't even have a horse. And the farmer would tell him, he said, don't jump to conclusions. He says, we don't know if the horse was stolen. All we know is the horse is missing. We don't know where the horse is at. Don't jump to conclusions that horse is stolen and I made a mistake. I don't think I made a mistake because we don't know the full story. 15 days later, the horse comes back with 12 horses, wild horses from the forest. The neighbors come, we are so sorry, you are right, we don't know the full story. And then the, and, and the, the farmer says, don't, don't praise me yet, we don't know the full story yet. He says, I know this is a cause for celebration, but he says, we don't know the full story. We don't know how everything will unfold. All that I know is the horse is back and we have 12 wild horses. Yes, and they said, yeah, yeah, but honestly, it's, it's a good breakthrough, you God. And he says, no, we don't know that. His son was training one of the wild horses and the horse kicked him, broke both of his legs. Now the neighbors came and they said, ha, yeah, you're right. We knew this is not a blessing. These wild horses, yeah, they were not a blessing. Look, your son cannot walk anymore. And he would tell them, you don't know that. All we know is my son can't walk. 
but we don't know the full story. That's why we can't jump to conclusions looking at the small ingredients in the story. We have to always wait. See, the wisdom waits for God's intervention. A war breaks out and they take all of the sons in the village except one who had broken legs. Now the neighbors came back and they said, lucky you. We lost our sons to war, but you have your son. What I want to tell you is this, when you have the fear of God, it helps you not to jump to conclusions. When life has twists and turns, you end up in jail like Joseph and like, oh, it's over. The fear of God says, no, this is just a baking soda. God is making a cake. I don't know how he's going to do that, but I know my God and I know he's a good God. When I don't see him, I don't feel him, I fear him, I trust in him. And that's where the wisdom comes in. And you don't jump into this impulsive decisions trying to make something happen because the fear of God gives you this peace. And another thing, when you have the fear of God, you have the freedom not to fear anything else. People fear today everything, spiders, elevators, heights and lows. People fear of marriage, people get afraid of divorce, death, sickness, stuff people fear. People fear people. But see, the fear of God kills all other fears. You no longer fear man. You no longer fear death. And that's why you don't have to take the compromise. Why? Because you only fear God and the fear of God brings safety. But the fear of man is a trap. Jesus says, do not fear those that kill the body. But He says, fear Him who can kill the body and the soul. And we saw that during COVID with three, four masks in a house where nobody's there. 23 years of age. Why? Fear. Fear will cause you to do irrational things. Fear will cause you to look for stuff that is just not even there. It's sometimes it's a false evidence appearing real. But when there is no fear of God, you will fall for every fear. People who are like, I don't want to fear God. You're going to fear something else. I'll rather fear God than fear man. I'll rather fear God than fear my circumstances. I'll rather fear God than fear somebody's opinion. I'll rather fear God than to fear the government. I'll rather fear God than to fear death. I would rather fear God. Don't be afraid. Fear God. That's the message of the Bible. Somebody say Amen. Secondly, wisdom prepares for the future. It doesn't procrastinate in the present. So wisdom comes from the fear of God. And this wisdom that comes from the fear of God teaches us to view life from God's point of view and not rush into conclusions that, oh, this is bad. Oh, this is good. Sometimes we don't know fully. There is a God. We're not Him. And the fear of God teaches us to trust in Him when we can trace Him. And to have a view that's point of view of heaven. Than our view. The second thing that the wisdom of God teaches and that's huge in the book of Proverbs is this. It teaches us to not slack. Biblical wisdom a lot of times refers to practical skills associated with understanding and living a successful life. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 6 and 8. Go to, an, to the end you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise which having no captain, overseer or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. I want you to see the wisdom's way from an end, from the end. Number one, there's a self-motivation without external pressure. This is when you know you're wise, when you can motivate yourself and nobody has to pressure you for things. Nobody has to constantly bribe you or punish you for you to do the right thing. There's an internal motivation and that comes from wisdom. The second thing is this timeliness without procrastination. Meaning there's no postponing of tasks. And that's the way of the end. And the Bible tells us, go to the end and learn wisdom. What do we learn from the end? Is there's self-motivation. There is no procrastination. And the thirdly is there is preparation for the future. The end does not live only for today. Now the end doesn't expect, expect bad things. It prepares for, for bad things. It prepares for the winter to come. Five marks of a sluggard. Now if you don't like the biblical word sluggard, put it something simple. Lazy. Well, wisdom and laziness do not go together. If you are lazy, you are a fool according to the scriptures. 
you will make foolish decisions. Your life will be ruined. One of the things the wisdom from God teaches us is wisdom produces a personal, disciplined, hardworking, good work ethic. The five marks of a sluggard, procrastination, neglecting their duties, love of sleep, making excuses and lack of initiative. Wisdom are not those things. That is the way of not wisdom. That is the way that is not right. And what's going to happen with people who lack this wisdom is this. They will have poverty because neglecting work and responsibilities lead to financial instability and lack. The devil took my finances. No. You loved sleep. You loved to eat. You didn't love to work. You procrastinated, came left, left early, always distracted. Poverty is a result of laziness. Could it be a demonic attack? Yes. But for many of us in the country, a land of opportunity is not just a demonic attack. If we track our life, we will see when there is lack of wisdom, there will be no wealth in our life. The second thing that laziness brings, which is lack of wisdom, is unfulfilled needs. Needs become unmet due to our inactions. The third thing is ruin and decay, deterioration of your property and resources. The scripture says your, your roof begins to leak in the house. And some of us live like that. You walk into the house, the sink is broken. All the cabinets are not working. A dishwasher is not working. Nothing is working. Nothing is running except our mouth. And we're lazy and it's always tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to fix. Tomorrow I'm going to do this. Tomorrow we sleep through. We just entertain ourselves. We lack and we're like, man, God give me wisdom. How can He give wisdom to a person who chooses to live like a sluggard? Wisdom is this, is I refuse procrastination and I prepare for the future. I don't expect bad things, but I prepare for bad things. I prepare for the rainy day. I don't waste all my money because they come in. And just because I got a raise, it doesn't mean I raise my debt. No, I lower down my debt and I prepare for the rainy day. I don't live with this assumption. Only good things will happen to me. Nothing ever happens that is bad and I'm going to live just for today. The Bible says don't worry about tomorrow, but the Bible teaches us to prepare for tomorrow. The fourth thing that's going to happen is public dishonor. People who live lazy lives, they have poor reputation and scorn within the community. And it's not a devil's attack. It's biblical consequence of living as a sluggard. People don't like to hire lazy people. Everybody tells on them and then a lot of times that reputation that's connected with the person that is slothful, lazy, always forgetful, a procrastinator, neglects, neglects their duties. They either need to be penalized or always bribed or always massaged to do something, always encouraged. They don't have inner self propeller that drives them to do different things. Nobody wants to work with them, work under them, for them and live with them. It's a punishment. It's, it's, it's painful to do that. And that's exactly what happens. They develop a poor reputation. And last thing is they develop dependency. They depend on others because of their unwillingness to take care of themselves. Wisdom is choosing to be active today and prepare and plan for the tomorrow. Foolish virgins didn't lack purity, but they lacked preparation. Therefore they were foolish and missed the bridegroom. They assumed they had enough oil. They assumed inflation will never happen. They assumed they'll never get laid off. They assume economy will never change. They assume that if they will need oil, somebody will borrow them. They assume the king will never or the bridegroom will never come late. A lot of assumption and no preparation. Interestingly, they were virgins. They were not prostitutes. They were not immoral. What they were is foolish. And sometimes we focus so much like, hey, I just want to walk in purity, which is extremely important to walk in purity. But the scripture says to also walk in wisdom. That means that you got to plan for things ahead as you can. Don't live with this assumption. And I want to just speak specifically right now to finances because times are hitting that are hard. And people who practiced foolishness when things were good in their life are now getting bit. When Joseph became a prime minister, Joseph took seven years of prosperity. He did not just buy a yacht, a mansion and a BMW. 
Joseph took the seven years of plenty and saved not 10% like most of us don't do even. He saved like Mormons, 20%. Mormons give 20%. And so he saved 20% of all that income. And then when the famine came in, he was able to feed the whole world. My friends, I'm going to tell you something you probably don't want to hear. Famine is coming. Famine is here. Rain is going to come. Hardships will come. It's too late to work on your marriage when your marriage got you served with divorce papers. Work on your marriage when your marriage is good. It's too late to work on your purity when now you're addicted and you can't come out. Now you need deliverance. Work on your purity when you are walking good. Begin to invest in your purity then. It's too late to begin to save money when now you don't have money to feed the children. No, begin to save money. Begin to plan for the future when you're having promotions and blessings. There's nothing wrong with buying nicer things, upgrading things. There's nothing wrong with that. But many people today live like this. They max out all their spending with their giving. They have no breathing room and they're like, the devil is attacking me with depression. No, the devil didn't make you buy a Gucci bag. That was you. The devil didn't make you buy that truck when your other truck was working just fine and you know, oh but I can afford the payment. See that's the problem. You can't afford the truck but I can afford the payment. The sales guy lied to you. And so what begins to happen is we make foolish decisions. They're not immoral decisions. We're still virgins in the presence of God. We're walking in purity. My God, I love Jesus. I just want to thank God for this hat that I got that's $600, $600. But God has been good to me. And then the famine comes. The devil's been attacking. The devil's been attacking. Ah, not really. Life just happened. Life has good and bad. Life has rain and sunshine. Rain has, life has famine and it has plenty. And the wisdom says this, when times are good, they don't last. I'm not being negative. I'm not being doubtful or afraid. I'm just being realistic. Life, good things don't last. So when times are good, steward them wisely. So when the bad times come, you can endure that. And when times are hard, steward them wisely and they'll turn into good times. Don't eat everything you make. Practice wisdom. Don't shop on the level of your dreams. Shop on the level of your income. But I have a dream. You can't shop on the level of your dream. But my, my credit card can handle it. Your credit card might handle it, but then you will live with stress if things change and they tend to change to people who are not prepared for change. The ones who seem to be prepared for change somehow avoid sometimes. Not saying this happens all the time. I'm saying this as a general rule. Plan for things. Prepare for things. Amen. Wisdom is, comes from the fear of God, which helps me to view my problems in a different light. Wisdom teaches me to not procrastinate, to be active, initiate things and to plan for the future. Oh well, the Antichrist is coming. That's why you should have a retirement fund. Oh, but the world is going to end. That's why you should go to college. The end of the world should not be the end of your wisdom. The Bible says in the last days people will build homes, people will get married, people will have children, people life needs to continue. God decides when that day happens but He gives you and I wisdom to plan for the future. We plan for the future in this church as though we're gonna live for another thousand years but we need to be ready to meet the Lord tonight. It's living with this, these two contrary things at the same time. We plan, we send people to schools, we plan, launch churches, we build another campus but we have to be ready that Jesus can come tonight. Live with that thing that He can come any moment and prepare and plan for the future like He's not going to come for the next 2,000 years. He said soon, 2,000 years ago. That's why I don't say soon to anybody. People say, when are you going to be, uh, you know, when are you going to come? I don't say soon. Because if I say soon, it could take 2,000 years. <laughs> Lastly, is this helping anybody? Yes. Wisdom flees temptation. It doesn't flirt with temptation. In the Bible, wisdom is seen as moral quality rather than intellectual one. Being foolish, really in the Bible a lot of times means being godless. 
J.I. Parker, uh, Parker said, Wisdom in fact is the practical side of moral goodness. A wise man fears and departs from evil, but a fool rages and is self-confident. Proverbs 16, 6 says, In mercy and truth atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord one departs from evil. Proverbs 5, 8, is, 8 it says, Remove your way from her and do not go near the door of her house. So we have a lady lust and we have a lady wisdom. Like two ladies are calling you all the time. Two ladies are always reaching out to you. It's the lady of immorality, lady of impulse shopping. It's the lady of lust. It's the lady of anger. It's the lady of profanity. It's the lady of idolatry. And it's the lady of wisdom. It's the lady of honor. It's the lady of discipline. It's the lady of righteousness and holiness. Wisdom doesn't just run from sin. It avoids situations that lead to sin. We must understand is unwise decisions are often lead to wrong ones as we excuse them for not being outright wrong. And that's why we shouldn't ask always, is it wrong? We should also ask this question, is this wise? Because it might not be wrong for you to buy that new thing, but in light of what's happening, is this the wisest thing that you do with your extra finances? It might not be wrong for you as a man to go on a trip and as a married man with your secretary alone and just be there alone. But is this the wise thing to do? Of course it's not. It might not be wrong to do certain things when you're dating and spend all that time together, especially in the evening and you're not in a group of, in a community and it's like past nine o'clock and no, there's no scripture in the Bible that says, Thou shall not spend time alone after 9 p.m. It doesn't say that, but it doesn't take a theologian to know that after 9 p.m. two people alone on the couch does not lead to more righteousness. And then people are like, oh, we don't know what happened. We fell. I know what happened. You did multiple things that were not wise and you did them because you said they're not wrong. But nobody does the wrong thing until they do multiple things that are not wise. <laughs> Financial calamities happen a lot of times the same way. It's just like, I don't know what happened. Well, if you look back, you will see one unwise decision, another unwise decision, another unwise decision. And this is the excuse. That's not wrong. This is not wrong. This is not wrong. This is not wrong. This is not wrong. And then you end up doing something that is wrong. You're like, I don't know how that I got here. Well, I'm, I'll give you a very simple math. Do multiple things that are not wise. Excuse them because they're not wrong. You will find yourself falling into the wrong thing. You won't fall, you drifted into it. And so that's what the Bible teaches us, not always to focus on, make sure, is it right or wrong? That's important, that's the first question. But we go even a step further. It's not legalism, it's wisdom. Is this the wisest thing? In light of my past, in light of my present struggles, in light of my desires, dreams, and the calling of God, is this the wisest thing to do in this situation? And if the answer is no, then for you, that is no. Don't look for a scripture, but the Bible. Yeah, but the Bible has four books on wisdom and the Holy Ghost gives you wisdom. Do the wise thing and you will find yourself in righteousness and purity. Wisdom teaches us to sweat the small things because they add up. Give the devil an inch, he'll become a ruler. The scripture says not even a hint of sexual immorality. A little laven Leavens, a little leavens the whole lump. Catch little foxes, Song of Solomon says. The scripture says about poverty, a little of sleep, a little bit of slumber. And so it's not a lot of sleep. It's not like you're sleeping like a bear three months in a row. Just a little bit there, a little bit there, a little bit there. They all add up. And the wisdom comes and says to you, sweat the small stuff. Why? Because they add up. Compromises add up. A little bit there, a little bit there. Your conscience becomes less sensitive and then you become a little bit more open to that, a little bit more open to that. And then you find yourself falling into something you're like, I would have never. I made fun of people who do those things and now you're doing that. How did that happen? It's not only because you were self-righteous and judgmental. It's because you were not wise. Wisdom. Meaning, you walk and you treat those small compromises like they're big ones because they will lead to big ones. It's like that village that you know went hunting and found a cub lion and they brought this family brought this cub lion to the village and the chief of the village came to the family and says you got to get rid of the cub. In fact you got to kill it. The family looked at the chief and they said you're a monster. 
Our kids love this cub. We ain't get, getting rid of it. He says, the problem is it's a lion cub. This is not a pet. No matter how much love you give it, there's a wildness that is there and it will come out. So the family rejected the advice of this chief and next thing that happens is this cub grew with the rest of the pets in the house. It got domesticated until one day either some kind of a trigger of blood or something and its wild nature came out and it killed all of the children. And then the villager had to come and kill it now as a full-grown male lion. And that's exactly what happens with our sin. A lot of times we're like, oh, but it's a pet sin. I'm controlling it. I got a program for this thing. I'm managing it. The problem is that it doesn't matter how much perfume you put on a snake, it's still a snake. Snake only knows to do what snake does. You can't domesticate sin. You can't bring it into your life and normalize it and say, if, you, if I love it, I know he doesn't want to serve Jesus. I know this guy is evil, but I'm just gonna, you know, flirt to convert. The Bible says there's only one person who convicts people of sin and it's not your charm. It's the Holy Ghost. Do not disobey God's Word when the Bible is very clear and say, no, I'm gonna avoid God's Word, but I'm gonna do it my way and God's gonna meet me and give me a miracle. My friend, that is not promised. Don't flirt with sin. Flee sin. Be like Joseph. Potiphar's wife came and says, hey boy, you know what? My husband is not here. Nobody gonna see it. There's no cameras. Nobody's gonna notice this. And Joseph said, I fear God. Joseph says, this is great wickedness. He didn't say, yeah, it's a weakness. You know, I kind of, kind of understand, you know, been always, you know, as a guy, just kind of, you know, um, been looking for some attention. My daddy didn't give it to me, you know. And the Lord would understand. The grace of God will cover it all. Joseph didn't do that. And there was no Ten Commandments about do not commit adultery. This was before the law. What kept him running from sin was fear of God. He fled sin. If this would have been us today, we were like, well, I'm not going to fall into sin. I'm just going to talk to the girl. Now lay hands on her. I'm going to show her the love of the Father. Come here, come here. Just, you know, we're not going to sin. We're just going to come as close to the cliff as we possibly can without falling. That, that's, that's what I'm going to do. And that's what we do. Most of us, what we do is we don't flee sin. We flirt with it. Because we lack the fear of the Lord. We lack of wisdom. Wisdom teaches you to flee the things that everybody else flirts with. In other words, instead of asking how close to the cliff can I get without falling, you should say how far can I stay away from this thing so that I can walk in righteousness. Amen.